Okay, I've been teaching uh, long enough to uh, learn that anytime there's a lull, then, then I start. So it <laughs> doesn't matter if we're on time or, or not. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, mention um, <clears throat> where we're going to go in this, uh, in this talk. And what we want to do is integrate this uh, discussion of the theory of interest into our previous um, discussion on, uh, yesterday on uh, the theory of price. <clears throat> so again, one of the advantages of the Austrian uh, approach is that everything is integrated from the foundation, right? It all builds on this realistic foundation of uh, the human uh, persons and human condition of action and, uh, and so on. <clears throat> So uh, yesterday, when we talked about price theory, we left two um, issues um, untouched. And one of these issues, you uh, heard a talk on by uh, Dr. Engelhardt uh, yesterday. And this was on money. So we didn't uh, make any attempt uh, in talking about price theory to talk about the price of money. Uh, one of the great achievements of uh, Ludwig von Mises um, uh, the very first uh, book that he wrote uh, and published in 1912, Theory of Money and Credit, <clears throat> he showed how to apply this approach of preferences and demand and supply to money to also explain the price of money, the purchasing power of money. Uh, so, we, uh, so that gap has been filled, hopefully, uh, uh, already, which leaves us with one other issue that we did not uh, address in talking about price theory yet, and this is the element of time. So all we talked about on Monday, and all that Dr. Engelhardt talked about with money on Monday, is what in finance we might call the spot price of goods. You know, the actual cash exchange prices here and now in markets, that's what we talked about. But most of you uh, know that uh, in addition to spot prices for goods, there are also forward prices. And then there are derivative markets, right? Futures and options and swaps that derive from the forward price. Uh, and the forward price then introduces us to the temporal aspect of action. And so that we haven't yet discussed, and, and, and so we want, to, uh, we want to broach that topic in this in this talk, and then integrate again uh, this discussion uh, uh, the, uh, of time, uh, and, and then interest, of course, uh, refers to the intertemporal dimension of things, uh, prices. Uh, we want to integrate this with our price theory. <clears throat> now, we'll proceed in, uh, in three steps. Uh, first, we just want to talk, as we did on Monday, just about fundamentals. It's about the, there, we, remember, we talked about the fundamentals of uh, human action as purposeful behavior, and we concentrated on the finite nature of the human person. Right? So we have ends, but our means are limited. We're finite beings. We can't just uh, will our ends to be attained. Um, we make this distinction between ends and means, and then we design action by employing the means to attain the ends. And uh, when we do this, uh, the satisfaction of our ends is uh, typically not perfect and, uh, and only temporary. Right? And then, then we have to act some more, right? We have to act again and value and, and so on. So action uh, continues on in our lives. Uh, in, in this talk uh, now, we want to concentrate on another fundamental character of the human person, that human persons are temporal. We're finite temporal beings. We exist in time, right? So we can also imagine infinite, eternal beings <laughs> right? who wouldn't engage in human action the way we do. So we're, we're temporal, and, and this is what we want to uh, concentrate on. So let's uh, again talk about what uh, is fundamental then about our existence uh, in time as human beings. <clears throat> and then we'll talk about uh, the second step, the two valuations that we make with respect to time and then the third thing we'll do is talk about the theory of interest. So that, that comes uh, in, in the natural sequence. <clears throat> okay, so here are some of the basic uh, principles of time. Uh, the first thing we want to highlight is that um, the, 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 the time at which we make a decision to act and the realization of our end are never synchronous. The realization of our end at the moment we decide to act is always in the future. 
to us. So there's never a, a, a synchronous uh, character in time of those two things. It follows, uh, this was the one point that we made about uh, temporal existence uh, on Monday. Uh, it follows that when we make a valuation about one end being uh, suitable for us to pursue in action, we can only anticipate the value of the realization of that end at the moment that we're deciding to act. It's only an anticipation. Notice we stress this because all of the important principles of entrepreneurship and profit and loss and so on, all of these important features of human life uh, stem from that fact. Uh, those of you who are familiar uh, with uh, neoclassical economics know that in neoclassical economics, they don't have this realistic human element of time. When they, when they put time into their models, it's uh, just like a time to the physicist. It's just a variable, right? <laughs> over which something is moving or, you know, action, markets are moving or something. It's just, a, it's just a placeholder, so to speak. It's just click, 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 time passes. But for us as human beings, time is much more robust. It has meaning to us, uh, a very important meaning that, again, if our theory doesn't incorporate, we, we don't have a very robust theory. We, we've sort of reduced it to certain elements that aren't faults on the face of it but aren't very uh, helpful in understanding human, uh, human action. And so that's where we begin. Now, my uh, definitions here of these concepts, I'm just following Mises and human action. So if you've read human action, you've seen these uh, definitions. Uh, Mises says, uh, one a fundamental aspect of time for us as uh, persons engaged in action is the period of production. The reason this is important, the period of production is, it's a choice variable. We, we can decide between different production processes that take more or less time. And, and therefore, the period of uh, what he calls the working time, the stages of production. Um, let's say you want to build an automobile, and you start by mining iron out of the ground, and then you know, shipping the iron to a steel mill, and then making steel. And then uh, in another step of production, you, you uh, form uh, body panels for the car. And then in the final step of production, you have an assembly factory where all the parts are of the car are put together. So there's a certain time structure to this production. There's working time involved, right? And we could imagine that each production process we could arrange in a technological way that would either lengthen out the time of production or shrink it. So there are various uh, uh, you know, automobile production processes that are more hand and labor intensive and less capital intensive. And they typically take a longer period of time. It's a choice variable for us, and so it's relevant, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, working time. And then there could be also maturing time. There could be the time between the end of the production, the physical production of the thing, and then the beginning of consumption. So the classic case of this would be uh, wine uh, uh, production. So you grow the grapes, right, and then you harvest, and then you make the wine, and then it sits. As a physical good, you're done with production, so to speak. I mean, you're done putting inputs into production, but you have this maturing time. The same thing could happen, by the way, with automobiles. The automobiles are produced, they're shipped to a dealer, they sit on the dealer lot. There's a marketing period, right? There's a maturing period where, where you're trying to find a, um, a synergy between the consumers and, and what you produced. Right? So, so this is always involved in, in uh, action as well. <clears throat> and then there's the duration of serviceableness of the good that's been produced. There's the durability of the good that's been produced. And again, the reason this is important for us as human beings is because we, we can choose. We can make cars that are more durable, and we can make cars that are less durable. And the production process for a less durable car might be uh, cheaper. The resource use, the opportunity cost might be lower. And uh, so we might have a market for that with uh, people whose wealth is... Uh, you know, not as great, right? Uh, the middle class. And then for the rich, we might make cars that are much more durable and feature laden and so on and so forth. This is a choice variable. And so it's relevant for our action to think, we have to think about um, our production of things with respect to these, uh, these elements. Um, there's also the period of provision. The period of pr provision is a, is a planning horizon. It's the time horizon over which we plan action. And again, th this is a choice variable for us. 
right? So we could, we could think out like uh, some of you are thinking about going to grad school and so you're planning out, right, uh, four years or maybe it's going to be five or you're thinking about, you know, what the career paths are beyond that and, you, right, you pl you're planning out over decades, maybe even uh, those of you who have uh, small children, uh, you know, you've come to the realization you can plan for things after you're dead, <laughs> right? We can have intentions to accomplish certain ends uh, in other people's lives after we've uh, left this uh, world. <clears throat> so this is important to us, right? It's relevant, and, and therefore it's a, it's a praxeological concept. It's, a, it's, a, it's an important uh, logical feature of, uh, of action. <clears throat> and then we get to the, uh, the point that is most important for interest theory, which is this distinction that we make between sooner and later. Now here again, I'll rely on Mises' uh, phraseology. You, know, you can't really improve on his uh, genius in these respects. So he says this, he says, time, as we experience time as human beings, time is an irreversible flux. So you have to love that phrase, right? An irreversible flux. <clears throat> and what he's trying to get a, uh, across, and once you hear that, of course, it should ring a bell with you, but what he's trying to point out is that time is not like means. It's not like labor or, or uh, let's say, capital funding or land or something, where we can accumulate a bunch of it and then expend it all at once on an action. That, that's not, time isn't like that. We don't, we don't like accumulate 100 days and then expend it all at once in a single action. Time is an irreversible flux. It just, move, it just marches on, right? And therefore, we, we, uh, we, we can't allocate time like a means. It isn't a means. It, it's, it's something in which our action is taking place, but it's not a means to us. <clears throat> and, the, the, and so the relevant concept, as Mises goes on to say, is between sooner in time and later in time. The reason this is relevant to us is because, again, it's a choice variable. We can choose to take an action sooner in time, or we can take the action later in time. How will we choose between taking it sooner and taking it later? We'll choose according to the way that we value those, those alternatives. And this is what uh, we would call economizing an action with respect to time. We economize our action with respect to time by choosing when to take the action. So for several different actions, uh, when we take it uh, matters for the value that accrues to us when, when we act. Uh, just to give you a mundane example of this, uh, well, it's mundane uh, to you. It's actually quite important to me. Sublime, I, I might add. Uh, my, uh, my wife uh, and I have our wedding anniversary on November 17th. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go to her tomorrow and say, honey, let's uh, celebrate our wedding anniversary. <laughs> you know, that would just be like... Now, of course, you might be married to someone where they would think that highly romantic. And it would be, but the point is it, it, it changes the value of it. When we take the action, we'll change the value of it, even if our action is exactly the same, even if we plan the, exactly the same event. Right? <clears throat> and so uh, the timing of our action matters to us. It's a choice variable, again. And, and this, is, uh, this is one of the ways in which we value with respect to time. Okay, so let's turn to that question. Um, the question, I'll put it this way, the timing of an action. So as we said already, the value of a good uh, or, or an action with a good can vary at different moments in time. And because it can vary at different moments in time, we'll take account of that. It doesn't mean we'll always take the action at the moment at which its value seems to be the greatest because that might involve cost, ancillary costs, right? And so the net benefit may not be as great. But, but we'll take account of it. That's the point. We'll, uh, we'll incorporate it into our decision, uh, this element of uh, different value that can accrue uh, to a good. Now here we're speaking about consumer and producer goods. So a consumption good, like a, 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 like a dozen roses that I might give to my wife for our anniversary, a consumption good like that can uh, vary in value depending on when I deliver the roses. Or to take a, uh, you know, an economic uh, uh, example, um, we could think about the oil market. So when oil is supplied on the market, 
and, and you know, bought and sold on the market, um, uh, its price might be different. The price of oil in the spot market today might be $70 a barrel, but it might be that the forward price uh, in six months is 100 or, or it could be 50 or it could, right? And so obviously, if you have these differences in value at different moments in time, the economizing thing to do is to move the supply of the good to where its value is higher, where its price is higher. And, and, and so that's what would happen. The speculators would be doing this in the market. Right? Uh, this is where forward prices and uh, uh, derivatives come from. So just like with any other uh, arbitraging activity where we take a good from where it's lower valued and supply it to where it's higher valued, anytime we do this kind of, you know, people are engaged in this kind of activity, uh, the marginal value of the good will come together. So if it were true that uh, the forward price of oil was $100 six months forward and the spot price today was 70 that difference wouldn't last very long because the producers of oil today would simply withdraw the supply and hold on to it and then supply it with the anticipation of supplying it six months forward. Or, or a speculator would buy it today if the entrepreneurs are too dull to see this and then, and then hold it off the market and supply it in the future. But the very act of doing this, of reducing the supply in the present and increasing it in the future brings the prices together. Right. And that's how we know that allocation has been uh, e economized, uh, that a profit has been earned. So uh, uh, here the timing of action is no different in that sense than uh, all, all of the pricing activity that we talked about again on Monday or the other discussions that you've uh, had already about production and allocation. Um, uh, okay, so let me, uh, for those of you who aren't uh, up to speed on this, let me just give you a definition of a forward price. So some of you may have never heard of this before. <clears throat> a forward price is when two parties today make an agreement to exchange a good uh, at a stipulated date in the future at a price they agree upon today. So the six-month forward price for oil, we have traders today saying, you know, getting together and saying, uh, I'll sell you oil at $100 a barrel six months from now. And the other guy says, yes, yes, I'll, I agree to that uh, trade. Now, obviously, just like any other trade, that trade would only be mutually beneficial if the two parties have different preferences. Right? The, uh, they must think differently about how the future is going to work out. So the one person who's selling the oil at $100 a barrel uh, in this forward contract six months from today thinks that the actual price is, uh, that's a better price than the actual spot price will be six months from today. But the person buying at, at $100 a barrel thinks that's cheap, right, compared to what the spot price will be uh, six months from today. They have, as we say, reverse preferences. And so they can make a mutually advantageous trade. And so this is where uh, we get uh, forward prices. <laughs> uh, and we mentioned already then the efficient uh, temporal allocation of goods. So this is the first way in which we value our actions with respect to time. And the second way is uh, what we call in uh, economic analysis time preference. And as I alluded to already, this refers to the distinction between sooner and later. Now, in order to tease out this uh, principle, just like we did with the laws of utility on Monday, we have to uh, make a satyrs paribus uh, assumption. We have to stipulate something, right? So remember when we did this on Monday and we talked about the laws of utility, we said, uh, suppose we have Caruso and he chooses a unit of uh, uh, coconut consumption of two coconuts, and then he has different ends to which he can put two coconut unit of uh, size. He can drink the coconuts, or he, he would also use two coconuts to eat the coconut uh, meat and uh, so on and so forth. These are stipulations, right? That isn't always true in action that you know, units are like this or that people choose in this way. Uh, but hopefully you can see right away that in, uh, in markets, units actually do come in equally serviceable amounts. A gallon of gasoline, 87 octane, same as every other. A gallon or a barrel of oil of a particular grade, same as every other barrel of oil and so on and so forth. So this, uh, it's a, a realistic uh, stipulation that, that applies in the real world. And so we could do the same thing, or we're doing the same thing, uh, when we talk about time preference. Time preference is 
the preference a person has for a given satisfaction sooner as opposed to the same satisfaction later. This again is a satirist paribus uh, uh, deduction that we make from the distinction between sooner and later. By the way, hopefully you can see that that just is, uh, when I say this, it just uh, rings true to you. Just like when I say the uh, second law of utility, the second law of utility is that more of a good is preferred to less. Hopefully when I say that, it's just, yeah, okay, I see that. A good is scarce, right? So more of it has to be preferred to less because I can accomplish more um, uh, with more of the good than I can with less of the good. So, so that has to be true, right? It has to follow out logically. Hopefully it seems just as obvious to you that the sooner satisfaction of a given end is preferred to a later satisfaction of the same amount, right, or the same, the same character, however you want to stipulate this. It just seems so. But for those of you who are somewhat skeptical of this, let me provide you then with uh, the logical implications that Mises again rehearses these in human action. The logical implications if we assume that that's not true. What if we assume that people always prefer a future satisfaction, a later satisfaction, to a sooner or present satisfaction? Well, hopefully you can see right away that if that were true, then a person would never consume. Because right now they prefer to consume you know, and get this satisfaction in the future, but when that future moment arrives, they'll also still prefer the future, right? That, that, that seems problematic. We know that people, in fact, do act. Uh, the other logical uh, alternative would be, what if we don't care between sooner and later? What if we're, uh, we, we have no preference? What if we treat them equally? Uh, th then what, what follows from that? Well, as Mises points out, what follows from that is, because we prefer more of a good to less, if we didn't have a preference for sooner over later, then we would start right now on the longest, most productive production processes we can technologically imagine. We'd forego any shorter uh, production processes that weren't more productive and engage only in the longest ones possible. But this again is, is precisely the opposite of what we do. What we actually do is we engage in the shortest, most productive production processes first and then exhaust those, and then we go to the longer, more productive production processes, right? So you can imagine, again, a kind of stylistic example of this. You have Adam and Eve kicked out of the garden, and uh, you know, instead of just uh, you know, hunting and uh, you know, gathering and doing these primitive uh, sorts of production processes, they, they, they hit upon the notion of uh, you know, building a, um, a framed house they can conceive, you know, of cut, cut, you know, uh, knocking down trees and cutting them up and so on and so forth. So they have to build saws first and so on. And so they set upon those production processes because that would be so much more valuable to them than just, you know, grubbing uh, on the ground and sleeping under the stars and in the rain and snow and so on. No, no, of course they don't do this. They, they set upon the shortest, most productive production processes, just again like we do today. So... Uh, this, this is the idea uh, that Mises uh, has in mind here. <clears throat> uh, okay, let me also mention that um, uh, just like preference, time preference cannot be shown false by examples. Again, Mises takes a few of these just to illustrate. Uh, but let me start with an example of preference just to show you again uh, that uh, the, the logic, the power of the logic involved in this. <clears throat> And this is an example I give to my students at Grove City College. Suppose we have a person, and this would be a fairly common experience, I, I imagine, uh, you know, among younger people, not among people of my age. But, and uh, <clears throat> it's something like this, you know, you, you come across a person, you meet a person, and, uh, and the person's smoking, smoking cigarettes. And as, as the person is smoking the cigarette, he's uh, telling you uh, how much he would love to kick this filthy habit he hates smoking cigarettes. He, he wants to, you know, he, he understands, oh, this is terrible for my health in the long run. And, you know, it's kind of uh, annoying to other people, right? I'm doing this and then blowing the smoke and they hate that. And, but I, I just can't stop or whatever, you know, excuse he gives to this. And then, and then, and then here's the question. Does this guy prefer to smoke? And the answer that economists give is yes, indeed, he prefers to smoke. How do we know this? Or what do we mean when we say that he prefers to smoke? Because his preference is always consistent with his action. This idea of demonstrated preference, right? He, preference is just that 
that valuing choice that we make between what we value more highly and what we value less highly. It ha we're just using the word this way, in other words. And so you can't, you can't say that, uh, you know, this, this guy who's smoking does not prefer to smoke, right? You, you, then, then you're using preference in an ambiguous way. That's not the way economists use the word preference. And so the same sort of logic applies to time preference. It's very difficult to come up with uh, counterexamples. Uh, Mises gives three possible counterexamples in human action. He says, suppose we have a guy who has a theater ticket for Friday night. And then he meets a friend, and his friend has a ticket to another theater production, also for Friday night. And the guy who has the theater ticket says, oh, I wish that ticket were for Saturday. See, I prefer the future good, right? I wish that, I wish it was not a present good, but a future good. And as Mises points out, this is not, is not a counter to time preference, right? This is just, again, the problem of uh, scarcity. We can't, do, we can't do two actions synchronously because we're finite beings. And so uh, they're mutually exclusive. We choose one over the other, right? And we always have to give up the one. The other case uh, seems a little bit more difficult, but actually, again, it's quite uh, easy to resolve logically. This is the famous uh, example of ice in the winter and ice in the summer. So we have a person who, in the winter, says, I prefer ice in the summer. But you see, again, uh, 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 Satyrus is not Paribus here, right? You, you, you change, you, the stipulation doesn't hold. You're not getting the same satisfaction uh, in, the, in, the, in the present as the, uh, compared to the future. Because having ice in the summer allows you to do all sorts of more enjoyable things that you wouldn't dare do in the winter, at least not in Pennsylvania. <laughs> you know, sitting out on the veranda and sipping iced tea, right? Yeah, you can do that. So, so I prefer the ice in the summer. Of course I do, because the conditions under which I'm going to consume in, at that moment in time are more valuable. Th this, hopefully, this rings a bell. This is the timing of an action, right? Of course I want ice in, in the summer because I can do things with it that are much more beneficial than I can do with ice in the winter. And this is not a violation of time preference. And then the third case he gives is of the miser. So the miser, right, who just hoards money, all the, it's a Scrooge McDuck, right? he hoards up all his uh, coins and swims in them in, the, in his vault or whatever, and, uh, you know, never expends. And as Mises points out, well, yeah, the miser has very low time preference, <laughs> right? He doesn't do much consumption in the present. He saves most of his um, uh, wealth, uh, but he doesn't have zero time preference or whatever negative time preference would mean. He still has a preference for sooner. It's just that he has very, very low time preferences, as we say, uh, uh, in, in economics. So, again, these don't seem to be very uh, 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 effective uh, counterexamples. <clears throat> so now, uh, from, from the, these considerations, we'll move on then to the discussion of the rate of interest. And here, <clears throat> we're going to talk, we're going to use this uh, terminology. We're going to talk about what we'll call the pure rate of interest. And the pure rate of interest is the premium that people place because of their time preference on the present. So it's the premium that people place on the present or sooner as opposed to later, uh, the future. This is how we define the pure rate of interest. <clears throat> uh, okay, so here's the schematic. Here's the logical schematic of how the argument runs out. <clears throat> And I've uh, superimposed uh, this with some of what we did on Monday. Uh, so again, to show you the integration of uh, how we integrate interest theory into price theory. So this top uh, uh, line is uh, what we uh, talked about on Monday for consumer goods. We have preferences that people have. And then because uh, the buyers and the sellers have reverse preference, they can uh, both gain in trade. And so they, uh, 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 those who want the good more urgently demand it. And those who have it, who desire to keep it less urgently, supply it. And then the market clearing price for the consumer good emerges. So we get the price of the consumer good. It's exactly the same logical structure for time preference. We have people with different time preferences. Some, like the miser, have low time preference. And some are, have a very urgent uh, present gratification that they want to uh, satisfy. They have what we call high time preference. 
And so the high time preference person is willing to pay the low time preference person a premium at which they can uh, both gain for the lending of the present money and then the payback in the future. And so this is uh, the, the, the second line. And we call that interest rate the pure rate of interest because it's, it depends on nothing but time preference. At the end of the talk, we'll get to the other factors that influence uh, interest rates. But, but at this point, we want to talk just about time preference. And then the integration comes uh, in, in the bottom part of the chart. And, and again, we talked a little bit about this on Monday. Uh, the the uh, prices of consumer goods generate revenue. So this is the marginal revenue product for the producer of the good. So whatever this consumer good is, let's say it's smartphones or whatever, the um, iPhone 10 that we used in, in our example on Monday, <coughs> um, selling the, the, the price uh, at which it's sold generates revenue for Apple. And so that's the marginal revenue. And then the product part, the marginal revenue product, the MRP, the product part is the uh, physical production of the producer good. Remember, we used the example of a tech worker. So the tech worker has a certain physical productivity in the production process. Generate, you know, with his team, he generates a certain physical product, a new innovative uh, uh, 3D uh, feature on the phone or whatever. And then, uh, and then the consumers value that to a certain extent, and then that generates marginal revenue product. And then the interest rate gives us the discount. So that's the D part in DMRP. That comes from the interest rate. So the entrepreneur's demand for a factor of production, if he pays in advance, if he fronts the money to the worker, paying the worker you know, every month as you go along, but the worker is producing something that's not going to be sold for, until next year, well, then the entrepreneur has to earn interest on that, on that loan, right? on that implicit loan that he's making. And so he discounts the wage. He's only willing to pay the marginal revenue product discounted by the rate of interest because he could take his funds that he saved up in the past and just lend them out on credit markets and earn the rate of interest. He doesn't have to engage in production to earn a rate of return. Uh, you can earn this in the credit markets. And then there's the opportunity cost of the worker, right? And these two factors then determine the price of producer goods. So again, this fills a gap that we, uh, that we uh, left on Monday. <clears throat> Okay, so now the next step, we want to, we want to look at these arrows, just like we did uh, again on Monday for the top line. We want to look at the causal arrows. How do preferences lead to demand and supply for uh, present money? How does the demand and supply for present money lead to the interest rate? <clears throat> now, one very important, this is critical, <laughs> and there's a lot of uh, discussion about this in the literature. Uh, for those of you who are in the... Um, uh, the graduate uh, seminar uh, that, that I'll do on Thursday, we'll talk quite a bit about this point, but here I just want to introduce it so you're aware of it. So here's, my, here's again the definition of the pure, pure rate of interest. It's the premium on the present, or we could say the discount to the future as we just went through. But this comes about in the form of intertemporal trade of money. So money actually has two prices. It has a spot price, an exchange price right now, the purchasing power of money right now as we exchange it, and it has an intertemporal price. Present money is traded for future money. Goods also have two prices. They have a spot price, the price today, the cash price that you would pay to buy it today, and they have forward prices. You notice people do not make loans in kind. There are no loans in apples or in... Uh, uh, you know, uh, lug nuts, or in machine parts, or things of this sort. Because if you made a loan in, in, in goods, then when the future came, the actual market value of the good could be radically different depending upon the timing issue, right? Depending upon the demand and supply conditions of the, the timing. Its consumptive value or productive value could be wildly different. And so people don't do this. Instead, they make their intertemporal trades only in money. This is because money is the medium of exchange, the general medium of exchange. And so it, uh, it's not subject to the vagaries of value from changing conditions of consumption and production. Every dollar always has an interchangeable uh, value in the market with respect to 
uh, its use as a medium of exchange. If I have $100 today uh, you know, in cash, I, I'm perfectly happy to trade it for $100 uh, somebody else has, right? 520s for 520s. But nobody would trade 620s for 520s today, right? They're, they're perfectly interchangeable. Or as we, we say, the um, uh, money is the, is the unit of economic calculation. And economic calculation uh, covers all possible configurations of calculating across persons, across places, across time. And so people uh, naturally gravitate toward money when they make loans and not goods. So, so that's an important uh, point. And uh, again, a lot can be said, more can be said about this, but we'll, we'll uh, leave it at that. <clears throat> okay, so here's how we go from preferences to uh, demand uh, for present money and supply of present money. So in the left-hand column, I've got a uh, one person who has these preferences. We're assuming, and again, we'll get to this at the very end, but we're assuming that the purchasing power of money does not change. We'll, we'll get to that. What happens if it does? We'll get to that later. So $1,000 today is preferred over 1000 in one year because of time preference. But there is some amount of money in one year that this person would be willing to accept in exchange for 1000 a day. And in my stipulation, it's $1,100. So if someone were to come along to this person and say, I'll pay you $1,100 uh, one year from today if you give me 1000 today, those preferences say this person would take that trade. They would prefer that. Now, the person on the right-hand side, person B, places a much larger premium on the present. In order to bid away $1,000 from person B, uh, someone would have to pay $300, right, a year from now. So we say person A has lower time preference. The premium person A requires is smaller or lower. And person B has higher time preference. It's much more urgent uh, demand for the $1,000 in the present. So the two of them could then uh, get together and make a mutually advantageous trade at any, any pure interest rate between 10% and 29%. Right? Uh, uh, person B would prefer to get the $1,200 today as opposed to, let's say, uh, I mean, 1000 today as opposed to $1,250, let us say, a year from today. So he'd be willing to pay $1,250 to person A. Person A ranks twelve fifty up here, so person A is happy to get twelve fifty a year from today and give up his thousand a day. That that's where the interest uh, rate comes from, the pure rate of interest, right? Just from this mutually advantageous trade, just like the price of any good comes from the mutually advantageous trade when two par uh, persons have reverse preferences. <clears throat> uh, okay, so now what about the market? Well, we'll skip over the details of this because we can, we covered this on Monday, right? So in a market, we've got a whole bunch of different people with a, a whole spectrum of uh, preferences across all these people. And so when they meet in markets, they gravitate toward exchanging at the market clearing price so that all of their preferences will be satisfied, just like we had explained on Monday. And so here we, we call this the time market. This is all the trade of present money uh, for future money. And then the interest rate is, is set by people or uh, you know, gravitates uh, toward uh, this point where all of the lenders can find a borrower and all of the borrowers can find a lender. That's the only rate at which this, this happens. Right. <clears throat> uh, okay, so that's again the uh, uh, ground that we uh, covered already. Now just to, uh, just to uh, summarize this uh, part, time preferences then determine both elements of the market, just like preferences in general determine both the price of a good and the quantity of it traded, time preference determines both the market clearing rate of interest, the market rate of interest, and the amount of lending and borrowing that goes on. There's nothing except time preference uh, behind uh, uh, the, these, uh, these phenomena in the market of prices and quantities traded. Now, it is true that, uh, it, it, uh, and I didn't stress this on Monday, but it is true that uh, economists, Austrian economists, recognize that preferences themselves are influenced by the circumstances in which we act. But there is no scientific relationship between the circumstances in which we act and 
the formulation of the valuations in our minds by which we choose one thing over another. We, we, we're just at a loss to know uh, scientifically uh, to give an account of this, right? And so that's why we start logically with preferences. But, but you shouldn't think that we're just uh, stipulating that people have preferences. We're not saying that. We're, we're saying that you have real people like you and me in real set of circumstances, and we go to the gas station today and we buy gasoline. That, that's what we're talking about. Or, you, you know, you go to a, a PNC bank and take out a student loan to, to uh, enter college. It's that that we're speaking about. You do that because... Your preferences are such and such within the circumstances of your own life. Uh, so uh, to highlight that point. And then the last point on this slide that I, uh, I'll make is that um, for the purpose of economic calculation that the entrepreneur is going to engage in, the time market allows the entrepreneur to have either present money or a, a, some amount of money in the future that these two are made equivalent by being able to lend and borrow. And so uh, in, in my uh, simple example, the future money is calculated as the present money or present value uh, times this uh, term one plus the rate of interest. So if I have $1,000 and I lend it out on interest for a year at 25%, I'll have $1,250 at the end of a year. That, that, of course, is called compounding. But if I'm, if I'm an entrepreneur and I'm investing $1,000 in a production process with the anticipation of getting $1,250 a year from today, I can know that those two sums are also equivalent, right? I can either have $1,000 today because of credit markets or I can have $1,250 in a year. So if, I, if I'm producing and selling something a year from now, I know exactly what, it's, what that future money is worth in the market as present money. And so the entrepreneur can now uh, compare all of the future revenues that he's going to receive uh, through production to present money that he's expending in order to set in motion production processes for that to occur. It's quite, again, a, a remarkable uh, uh, result. <clears throat> and then we want to talk uh, about uh, components of the time market. Um, the time market is made up of two major components. There are two ways in which present money could trade for future money. One we call the uh, credit markets. And in credit markets, there's a contractual arrangement um, that's made between the lender and the borrower. <clears throat> and so present money is lent under contract, and then the uh, borrower is, uh, again, uh, under contract, an enforceable contract, to pay back the stipulated funds in the future. And then we can further break down credit markets into consumer loans and producer loans. And then we can further break down consumer loans into the different types, right? The mortgage loans and uh, auto loans and general merchandise loans and so on. And same with producer loans, AAA, corporate bonds, um, adjunct bonds, and so on and so forth. And then the second part of the, um, the time market is the capital structure. And the capital structure is what we've been explaining all along where entrepreneurs are engaged in production by fronting money to the owners of the factors of production. They pay their workers on an ongoing basis. They buy their materials. Right? The auto company buys the parts and then assembles the car and then sells the car six months later. They're lending, paying upfront money, not under contract, but implicitly, with the intention of getting future money back when they sell the product. And that investment commands a rate of interest. Uh, one last point about this, producer loans, uh, by the way, all end up in the capital structure. So producer loans are not an independent part of the uh, time market. They have no causal Im importance in explaining the time market. The time market is explained just by our demand for consumer loans and the entrepreneur's demand for uh, uh, factors of production. And that's it. I, I point this out because the neoclassical theory of the interest rate is uh, the supply and demand for producer loans. Just that, right? And so again, you can see a pretty uh, distinct uh, contrast between the Austrian approach and the approach uh, of the uh, neoclassical school. <laughs> now, let's, uh, I'm getting to the end so, of my time, so let me uh, mention one other uh, aspect of uh, the time market. 
Uh, and this is the arbitrage, we've mentioned arbitrage before. This is the arbitrage that would take place to create uniformity of the pure rate of interest across all loans. So suppose, to the contrary, suppose we had uh, consumer loans here in the left panel, and the interest rate was very low at point A, and we had loans, uh, not, uh, implicit loans uh, in the uh, production processes that uh, entrepreneurs were making where they were earning uh, very sizable rates of return. Then what would happen, of course, is that the uh, capitalists who, who supply the funding would shift their supply out of the low interest rate loans, moving back to point B, and into the high interest rate loans, again, until those uh, interest rates came together. And so we see, even though we don't necessarily see the same interest rates across all loans empirically, we know that the pure rate of interest is actually being equated underneath that, right? We don't, even though we don't see it empirically. <clears throat> uh, and uh, so the last thing I'll say then on that point is that this is just another example of the uh, robust explanatory nature of the Austrian approach. What we're really trying to explain is the unseen meaning of action, right? In addition to the empirical uh, features of it, we can explain the actual meaning of it to human persons, whereas again our neoclassical friends explain only the empirical. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.